from TMP to TT and G for sure the cure and those tired meme jeans Hella can sell and the promise ring Sunny day real estate and rights this spring Prince Twinkle Daddy's help keep the dream alive I constantly thank God for Algernon and Remo Christie front drive Mineral snowing high tide hotelier and more Rio Limo only consists of the DC emotive hardcore Disavowed lonely word. Have you heard the disavowed and lonely word? Have you heard the lonely disavowed e word? Have you heard the tired and lonely disavowed e word? Uh, so this is officially starting, and it's episode 48 of the E-Word podcast. It's the final A Decade Under the Influence episode. We're talking 2019. We have a great cast of people to talk 2019 with. One of those people would be Owen from Shingard. Owen, what's up? Not much. Just hanging in there. How are you? I'm okay. It's been a very rough week, but I'm glad to be here and doing this. Um, keeping on with our guests. They're all from Pittsburgh. We also have Alex Martin, who plays in short fictions and books all of your favorite bands. That is very true. All Excellent. of it. Excellent. And then we also roped in last minute, we have Ryan from short fictions as well. Ryan, how are uh, you? I'm hanging in there. I'm doing good. How are you doing? <laughs> I've had a shitty week, but I'm glad to be here. And of course, uh, my friend Ellie, who is in Texas and not in Pittsburgh. Ellie, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, so the other day I woke up to a, a Reddit chat message um, from a brand new Reddit user, uh, Guitar from Stockton. And the text read in full, you're a fat faggot. And it's hard to get mad at something because like when it's just like objectively true but <laughs> <laughs> to spite this person i went on a three mile hike round trip and then ate a burrito the size of a fucking toddler uh <laughs> yeah, that's epic. yeah and the burrito absolutely uh was at least three-fourths the size of the biggest dick i've ever sucked so you know <laughs> <laughs> suck on it stockton <laughs> how's everyone else doing <laughs> uh, it's, good. it's it's nice to be talking to more than like two people at once for once. Yeah, yeah is everyone doing like regular FaceTimes with their friends? No, no. I don't yeah. have friends. For, for me, if I'm I feel like I'm doing more. If not, just because like I'm working with like 15 bands right now, and everyone is very like upset, confused, and frustrated. So it's just literally, it's just I feel like my days are just like four to five hours of just like facetiming literally everyone i work with just making sure everyone's chill yeah That's, i've been uh, with my friends in boston a lot because i haven't got to see them since i left school up there so it's been i don't know that's been really nice to talk to them again because i love them all so dearly so i have been telling all my friends hey i'm here if you need to facetime and then quickly finding out that i don't actually like facetiming or talking on the phone <laughs> I feel that. I was honestly scared to even like do this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We have like we have like a list of things to talk about, which always helps. I wish in every conversation I just had like a list of topics to hit. Oh yeah, <laughs> for real. But then Check it's it also out. with conversations. It's fun because there's like numerous tangents you can go on. Oh hell yeah! Kyle had to dip out, but the other day I did a a podcast with invite the neighbors uh no one cares about your band uh punks and pubs and the emo trash where we just sat and talked about what it was like to do an emo podcast 
Yeah, that's uh, like an all star lineup of uh, podcasters right there. Oh yeah, it was it was fun, and it was actually like really serious. So I had to turn off my persona and like not be a, a dickwad to everybody. Uh, which, <laughs> was that, was that, what was that? As I said, was that hard for you? It was extremely hard because, as you know, like my default mode is just be extremely cruel. Yeah, I mean, um, I, and I feel like I, I feel like we all need. I mean, I can't speak for everyone else. I need that right now. The world is so fucked up right now, so it's just like it's it's nice to have someone with his fiery comeback and just like in your face shit with you. Listen, if you're a fan, if you're a fan of cows being sacred or holds being barred, you're not going to be down with this podcast, all right? Because I'm. <laughs> I'm a take no prisoners motherfucker. Uh, <laughs> check out my new special on Netflix. Are you triggered yet? Oh my god, <laughs> Louis C.K. <laughs> Allie, have you ever da- like have you ever dabbled in stand up before? Uh, I did stand up uh, for about three years. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah, I did stand up from. The, are you out of the game currently? Yeah, I did stand up from 16 to 19. Um, yeah. Those are and that's like. Yeah. like I feel like that would be a hard time to like do stand up, like being that young. Mm-hmm. It's crazy because I think the first stand up set that I ever did, which is the the one that you're supposed to bomb really hard, that is actually my best stand up set ever. And then after that, I quickly realized that I was not actually uh, very funny talking to a whole bunch of people. Um, but I would I would like to try doing it again, do more like uh, kind of like a combination of stand up and spoken word, because I I really do like that world. Um, and I, th- I feel like there's a lot of room for crossover between stand-up and uh, DIY. But... Yeah, no, that's that's true. I, I at the uh, at the the Focellas or like any of the Summit Shack festivals, Connor is you know usually booking comedians, and it's it's kind of sick to see that yeah. crossover. That's not something that happens very yeah, often. Yeah. So we have this docket of 2019 albums, and I just want to say off the bat, I'm really glad we're doing this episode. Because when we did like the best of 2019 episode at the end of the year uh, last year, I didn't really have much emo in my top albums list. Same. And yeah, I'm just now coming to realize after looking through this album that it was actually a really good year for emo. I was just being a huge asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I like a lot of these albums in retrospect. Um, I just wasn't in the mood at the time, I guess. Yeah. A lot of them came out late. I feel like I wasn't really listening to music in like 2019. I was in my senior year of college, and also booking five to ten bands at the time. So I just I don't know. I was really into podcasts and stand up in 2019. Mm. So I was I was also late to a lot of these. I know that we already kind of basically talked about it, but just to get it like on record here, like what has. I hope this is the only time that we can talk about it because every podcast I've listened to has talked about it for like an hour on each podcast, but like how, like what has COVID-19 like done to your bands and lives and how are you getting by and, but like, I think like most importantly, what I want to get out of it is like what has proven to help your bands during this? Like, is it people buying merch? Is it the band camp sale, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, Well, coronavirus kind of screwed a lot of things over. I was supposed to go on a tour that had a lot of good guarantees and it was just supposed to be a great time. Then it got cancelled. I was going to put a deposit down on an apartment and now I can't really afford to do that. So, you know, it's it's not great, but I'm getting by. Uh, Started a Patreon for Shingard and we have like a podcast now. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And we're going to have a merch drop (laughs) soon. So, those things would help us the most. And it's also been helpful, like, we've had some articles written about us, like, or, like, mentioning us recently, which is, is pretty good. It's, like, good that we're still, like, kind of relevant on that stuff. But, like, we're still being productive, like, throughout this time. It's it's not easy, but it is what it is. Yeah, I, I mean, it's 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 been it's been really rough. We were also uh, going to play uh, a bunch of showcases for South by Southwest, um, and then, you know, when all that stuff got canceled, we decided, well, why don't we just, you know, we had bought all this merch uh, for it. And we're like, well, let's just tour down to Texas and we'll drop Ryan off back at school and we'll come back. <laughs> Everything just got canceled and we just couldn't do anything. Uh, but we ended up making a video on uh, Instagram. Um, it was like crazy Ryan bit that Sam called me up for. And uh, I think we sold like close to like $2,000 in merch, which was really nice. So that 
helped a lot. Um, it was very cool that people were, you know, so, so willing to help us uh, during this 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 time. Um, but yeah, that's Alex. You want to take over the rest? <laughs> yeah, uh, I feel like short fictions. I mean, I feel like literally everyone in the world right now got the short end of the stick. So it's just like, no, I mean, every it's it's the first time that every band in the world is like in the same ballpark of like where we can't go out and tour mm -hmm. and so like i don't know over the last like couple weeks i've been trying to really like turn at least my perspective to like all right well there's nothing we can fucking do right now no one can tour like let's just keep booking stuff in the future through like you know i mean i have stuff from like over from april to july i think i had 24 tours like at can so like i don't know now i've just been like booking stuff through fest right now just like we'll see what sticks you know what i mean but for me personally like my mindset or goals haven't changed because like you know it's not my job to fix this it's my job to like quarantine myself stay inside and like once this is over everyone is just gonna be back to where they were hopefully i don't know this is so weird it's like nothing anyone has ever had to deal with south by southwest getting canceled like really fucking broke my heart because i was supposed to like see a whole bunch of people again. I was supposed to see Short Fictions again. I was supposed to be Shannon again. I was supposed to see For Your Health again. Um, I was supposed to be Shingard. I was supposed to be Henderson from The Alternative. So I, f I feel like I, I lost out on a lot of friend time. And now I'm just stuck at, like, literally, we're at the point now where me and Dina are watching, like, True Life all night. Uh, <laughs> last, last time I watched uh, True Life, I'm being slut-shamed. And... Uh, <laughs> There was a, there was a dude on it who was just like this enormous misogynistic fucking piece of shit, and he was wearing like turnstile and backtrack and cruel hand shirts, and I just felt like uh, hardcore kids need much better representation in the media. Um, <laughs> we need we need heroes and positive role models to look up to. I think one thing that I've been hearing like more and more is like all the stuff that bands were investing in and lost. Like, I think, like, there was a dog, like, interview where they were like, yeah, we, like, bought new cases, we printed up all this merch, because we were gonna, because they just put out their album, they're gonna tour like crazy, and then, like, they're just sitting on all that stuff now, and it's just, like, dug yourself such a huge hole that you didn't know that you could even get into. It's yeah, fucked up. I mean, there's, there's, like, there's, like, bands that, like, we know that we listen to that are, like, you know, 30 to 40k in the hole yeah. for, like, six months of touring that just got, like... The Prince Daddy also Just Friends tour. Like I cannot imagine how much money they spent. That just like it's it's gone. Yeah. Like I mean it's gone. It's like or they can you know sell all the shit like in the you know when touring happens again. But mm -hmm. who knows when that's gonna be right now. And like the other thing is like I don't know if people even want to go to shows once this is done. Like yeah, like well, yeah, like people are gonna like be like afraid thing. to go out. I think if shows happen in like. 2020 and none of those shows are going to be above 300 to 500 cap yeah like there's no way there's no way months after like a global pandemic that like stuff just goes back to normal i don't know it's going to be a lot of rebuilding and a lot of like learning how to like i mean i think the the instagram live stuff is really cool like putting out merch stuff is really cool but like you know bands and management groups are gonna have to get like really 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 serious about trying to find new ways to like get bands media out to them within the next like six months because like i don't i don't there's it's just there's no way that touring is going to happen like within the next like three to four so mm -hmm. just so many rollouts just canned it's it's frustrating i feel bad for i feel bad for charmer i feel bad for you know dogleg like everyone that has you know a record rollout within the next like two months from now is like really hurt like i feel i'm really glad that short fiction's in Shingard and everyone who put out a record in 2019 did then because oh, I would I would be so devastated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, think about all the bands that are like probably gonna have something after like this clears up for the most part. There's gonna be so much music that needs to be like put out. And it's just like I don't know. I do, there doesn't even need to be an emphasis on like how are we gonna fix the music thing. Like right now, there needs to be an emphasis on like how poor people in our country are gonna survive like over the next couple months yeah i was thinking about that um because like in italy they already started doing like those that death panel thing but there's not going to be like 
any sort of those decisions made in America, the decisions are going to be made based on how certain the hospitals are that they're going to be paid for it, yeah. uh, which is fucking terrifying. They're already like having prisoners like digging mass graves. Yeah, the South is going to be shit fucked. time. <laughs> Because Southerners don't give a fuck about this. A lot of the South is also very, like, poverty-stricken. Places like like South Carolina or, like, West Virginia, uh, it's going to be, like, a fucking bloodbath. Sorry to bum everyone out. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I mean, it's important to talk about this stuff. I don't know. That's why I'm, I'm very glad to come on this podcast and talk about music that came out last mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. Anything else for the pandemic talk? Please, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let's pivot into 2019. Uh, we start these off with where were you at in 2019? What were you listening to? How are you doing? What were you doing? Et cetera. I was in Pittsburgh and Boston because I went to college for a semester. But I was balling off of 2020 and Death of Spring. We were on tour. It was a good time. I miss it a lot. Um, I was listening to a whole bunch of like math core and <laughs> pretty much most things that aren't emo. Like when, when I got sent like the list of all the albums we're going to talk about today, I'd say there were about like eight that I didn't listen to, <laughs> but I was doing really good last year. I don't know. It definitely was like, I'd say like the best year of my life so far. It was pretty Hell cool. Yeah. Good year. Um, all right. So I was also in uh boston and then in texas in the later half of uh 2019 i go to school down there now uh, in denton so i go to school for for jazz music so i was like specifically i had to listen to a bunch of jazz music in school it was like a requirement on the back half i've been listening to literally so much scrams uh this year it's embarrassing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's like literally it's either john coltrane or like you know seisha or i don't know like it's just i don't know it's been awesome it's been great i love scram so much i saw i mean wrist meat razor uh the metalcore sick metalcore band had put out uh that misery never forgets uh this past year and i thought that record yeah. was incredible it uh, was a really good zao record yeah yeah it was <laughs> <laughs> but yeah and i was doing well in 2019 and uh yeah, I don't know. Getting excited about a short fictions, uh, Fate's Worse Than Death release at the end of the year. So it was a good year, all in all. I miss it. Yeah, I miss it too. <laughs> uh, 2019 for me was my last full year of school, and I graduated in December. Like, I think I graduated like a week after our record came out, and I got my diploma and our LPs like the same day. So that was like what wrapped up 2020 for me. But in terms of like music, I don't in college I really only listened to like a lot of podcasts and stand up comedy. A lot of pretty much just like the bands I was working with, honestly. I feel like it's like what I listened to. A lot of taking meds, a lot of got me, and a lot of Kanye last year also. Also mm, last year I got into, uh, I got into Duster. Like I didn't even know who they were before last Sick year. Band. Yeah. You know what I learned that fucking blew my mind? Duster is ex Moender. Like, they have, like, legit screamo roots. That fucking, like, took me way by surprise when I learned that. That'd be interesting. But yeah, I don't know. 2019, I felt like I was just, like, on an autopilot mode because a lot of it was just touring when I wasn't in school. And there was just, like, a lot of school. That's all I remember. It was, it was pretty much just, like, me dissociating through, through college. Hey, Alex, who's your favorite stand up comedian? Ugh. I, I might get so much shit for this. I really like uh, Chris D'Elia. I've been hearing a lot of people like that I wouldn't expect to like Chris D'Elia liking Chris D'Elia. I think Ari Shafir is hilarious. Like, I'm sorry. I think he's so funny. Kyle, where were you at <laughs> in 2019? <laughs> um, 2019 was a good year. It was like probably the busiest year of my life. Just like doing this, being in two bands, uh, being in a relationship that was getting serious. Um, it was extremely busy. Uh, but it was ultimately like a really good year. I wasn't listening to much music. I think I basically listened to everything that was on this list and nothing else. And I'm yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Ellie? Uh, your started off real shitty because I was in the hospital. Um, yeah, that's right. 
Yeah, uh, that that feels like like a decade ago now. Honestly, though, um, so much happened in 2019. I had a lot of like really cool experiences. I went to a uh, Hope for Shelter Fest in San Antonio, which was like this uh, this big hardcore fest, um, and I saw fucking Race Trader play, which has been like a dream of mine for years. Saw saw a lot of bands that I was expecting to never like really get a chance to see. Like saw the Get Up Kids, which was dope. I don't know actually now now that I think about it whether this was this year or last year, but I saw Touche Amore for the twenty eighth time, which was amazing. Ooh. And like halfway through last year I did the Bands You Weren't Supposed to Like series, which was really, really, really fucking fun and uh drove the most traffic to my writing that I've ever seen and got me like a paid gig writing for the hard times and made me actually like take the jump to starting my patreon which is now at 110 dollars a month which is fucking mind-blowing to me um and now that i am like out of work uh and on unemployment i have time to start doing youtube channel which hopefully will boost that make me finally fucking self-employed like i've been wanting for ever um so all, all in all i think 2019 was a really pivotal year in my life and i listened uh, to a lot of shitty scene core from uh, the early 2000s, as well as uh, shit tons of hardcore and screamo. And looking at this list, there, th these were albums that I like gave like a mostly a passing glance to. But uh, revisiting them, um, I'm really excited to talk about a lot of them. Uh, so, any significant observations about emo in 2019? I added mine in here already, so I'll say that like DIY went absolutely crazy this year. Um, I think in the 2018 episode, we said that it, 2018 was kind of a return to DIY. There was a lot of bands like starting off their relatively big tours, playing DIY spaces in basements, etc. Um, I think in 2019, we suffered from too many bands and uh, too many bands uh, clout chasing. To go on about that, I just think like every band kind of acted like they deserved to be as big as the bands that they look up to and stuff. I don't know how else to put it, but I just kept seeing it last year specifically. No, I think, yeah. you know, everyone going out and touring and learning how to do it themselves and facilitate these own tours on their own, I think, I don't know, kids get really hungry, like, to to be able to, like, do the things. I mean, there's been so many bands that are now making the jump from DIY to, like, the bigger stage, which is, like, something that hasn't really been seen before, but I feel like Mom Jeans was, like, the really first big one to do that. Um, and there are, like, a lot of cloud chasers, but I feel like, for the most part, it's just, like, a lot of kids who are really trying to go out and, like, do something because they can. And I, I mean, I kind of admire it. As long as they're not being a fucking asshole, it's, like, you know, go out and do your thing. Just don't be a dick. Do you see any bands, like, trying to be competitive in that sense, though? Uh, oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but I, mean, sure. I, feel like, I feel like those bands are weeded out really super quick. I mean, yeah. I feel like the reason's, like me and a lot of the bands I work with, we all work really hard, but we're also, like, genuinely, you know, best friends and, like, decent people. Like, I mean, I don't know. No one really works that hard to, like, try to prove shit. It's just... I don't know. It's all it's all a community-based thing, and, like, a lot of kids miss that point. I think that's where, you know, the clout chasey gets, yeah. gets crazy when it's when it's when when there's a, a loss of... Yeah, I was gonna say, like, Cloud chasers are like pretty easy to weed out. Like we, you know, like you, you, you can, you know it when you see it, really. And all the Alex know. Martin bands are cloud chasers. Honestly, <laughs> oh, I love cloud. Cloud is sick. Cloud is the I root think, of all evil. Cloud, I think okay. something a, a lot of people are missing about the cloud chasing thing is like, I think in 2019 it kind of became like, kind of a way of life for people because that's how you survive on the internet now is just by <laughs> like accruing clout. Clout is currency. It's a, yes, it's a it's, it's a, a social brutal, capital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brutal fucking social capitalist infrastructure, um, and that's how you end up with crazy shit. Like, uh, hi, I'm I'm sorry, I can't afford enough emotional space to help you through this trying time. I mean, especially if you're a band, I, I feel like twenty percent of it is actually like being a good band, and the the rest of it is like marketing yourself and uh you know trying to find good opportunities and to, to flex um hmm. did anyone else think that emo kind of uh fucked with more heavier stuff in 2019 absolutely yeah throwing blast beats in there 
yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, like, crazy. I mean, with short fictions as well, it's, like, I feel like all these kind of bands that have, like, lots of twinkles have definitely been throwing dummy amounts of blast beats in, which is sick. Yeah, I don't know. I, uh, I approve the whole blast beat fad. I'm, I'm glad you approve. Yeah, it's sick. How much do you? How much of it do you think is down to like more screamo kids leaking into the twinkly emo scene at large? Because I feel like uh, the the scrams kids kind of kind of bring like a more baseline knowledge of hardcore to the table than uh, like the kids who got into it through more twinkly stuff. It's it's interesting because it's like in short fictions at least I feel like I feel like me, Sam, and Alex Barkley. Uh, and Shinpei are, like, all very much so, like, into the whole Scrams thing and, like, that entire <laughs> lifestyle, I guess, if you want to call it. Scrams um, lifestyle? Yeah, the Scrams, Scrams life. life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. We always are trying to figure out what we want to be. If we want to do Screamo or if we want to be a, a, a math pop band or a twinkly emo band. But we definitely draw a lot of inspiration uh, from Screamo music. I feel like I didn't answer that question right at all. <laughs> has anyone has anyone seen that picture of like uh, this cheerleader type girl who has a Sasha Tramp stamp? No. <laughs> no. I wish I, I wish I could find it, but that's like that that's like of a 2010 vintage, and I think that's the energy that uh, emo needs going into 2020. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I agree with that fully. I I was supposed to. I feel like there's gonna be a lot of. Uh, well, there was supposed to be a lot of Scrams emo crossover tours that probably are not happening now this summer that, like, I was going to be really stoked on because I wanted to, I don't know, there's something cool with having, like, mixed bills like that, like, Screamo band. Yeah. And, like, the putting only way that Screamo like, bands can get paid. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're forgetting about Screamo money. Yeah, Screamo money. Hayden from For Your Health lives off Screamo money alone. Hayden invented yeah. Screamo money. Yeah, that's, that's I, uh, crazy. <laughs> they um they uh, hopped in with us on a... Uh, uh, wait, where were we playing Alex again that they hopped into our van and they drove with us? But they left their Screamo knife in our, in our car. Uh, and I was holding on to Screamo knife for like ever. And uh, when I flew back down to Texas, um, I didn't realize, but I had Screamo knife in my fanny pack. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and I got on the plane, and no one said anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's super. I, yeah, yeah, it's actually it's like a terrifying. week. Yeah, but Screamo they knife. Saw, they saw Screamo knife in the X-ray machine. They were like, "Well, it's loud." Yeah, it's invincible. But uh, we probably have to do a skull split. Yeah. <laughs> they saw I, Screamo uh, knife, and they were like, "This person's in the FBI. We better not fuck with them." <laughs> <laughs> Are we ready to dive into the record by record? Yeah. All right. The winner winner right. of this year, you probably know it, and we're not going to talk about it, is Origami Angel Somewhere yeah. City. We talked about that album for like three hours, uh, like two weeks ago. Um, but I'm assuming everyone here likes it and can agree that it's a worthy yes. winner. They're, they're one of the freshest emo bands of today, I'd say. And they're yeah, such sweet I'm, I'm very biased, but I think Gami's the best emo band of all time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that tour we did with Garmy, uh, I got to get really, really close with both Ryland and Pat. They are such incredibly sweet people and uh, are fantastic musicians, so uh, they deserve every right to win that title. So, love Ward Garmy, they're great. Yeah, dope. Very kind folks. Yeah. Ripping, hooting and hollering. <laughs> Johnny Jang. <laughs> Johnny Jang. <laughs> All right, so the big dogs category are the ones that were in competition with Origami Angel, and there were two of them. One of them, Prince Adina and the Hyena with that album, Cosmic Thrill Seekers, lost by two votes. I think we all know this is a pretty good record, right? I was fully expecting it to win. Yeah. Um, then, like, even by the time the, like, the Gami album came out, I was like, I still think Cosmic Thrill Seekers is the lock for 2019. Uh, Somewhere City just being like a sleeper hit f flip the polarity but yeah Cosmic Thrill Seekers is uh, a really really cohesive 
a fun album to listen to. Uh, if I have like any criticism of it, I think it's that the lyrics are not as good as the first Prince Daddy LP, but it's it's still like up there. Uh, I th- I, probably my favorite song is uh, Clonopin, if I had to pick one. <laughs> yeah, that album had literally so much hype behind it that I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't think that there's like any way that record could have like lived up to that hype like there was so much hype behind it it was it had been like almost three years exactly since i thought you didn't even like leaving yeah 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 yeah. so it was like i mean there was there was a ton of anticipation around it you know the the single leaked you know quote unquote leaked in like april so i don't know i think i think counterintuitive did a great job of like building up around it um prince daddy did you know some really really meaningful touring like in the summer right leading up to it I don't know. It was it was weird because for me the difference between that and Gami was like, you know, there was the Gami release weekender in Pittsburgh, Philly and DC that we did all like house shows and it was wild seeing like, you know, 100 to 150 kids like capped out basements singing the words to like a record that like had came out like 11 hours prior. I mean, I had, I didn't see like the release of like Cosmic Thrill Seekers or anything like that, but I think, I don't know. There was just so much hype, and I think that might be the reason that like Gami kind of snuck in there and took it. I I will say uh, the first time I heard the singles, like I thought the mix on the vocals sounded like really gross. Yeah, um, I mean they they were like I it it's like Corey took at least my first. I mean I I grew to love it, but like yeah, same. The first part of it, I was like, damn, this is like Corey taking you know the first LP and just taking that grit and turning it up to like eleven and a half. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just because the vocals are mixed much, much higher than they were on the first LP. Um, it sounds like his throat is bleeding the entire time. Yeah, I mean, but also don't like don't forget that I'm pretty sure the first LP was recorded before Adult Summers, which would have been like 2015. So that was Corey like four years ago singing. So you can I feel like you can definitely hear the difference of like four years of like consistent touring and uh, and, and weed smoking. Oh, yeah, big time. <laughs> No, but awesome record. I I am I'm too surprised that that didn't win. I think I prefer the first LP to it. I do. Yeah, it's like I don't uh, know. Three songs is a lot of music, and it is. I I feel like for me, there's only like three or four bands that I could listen to a twenty song record all the way through and be like super fulfilled and not get like a little bit bored. I think uh, because Cosmic Thrill Seekers is such like an album like like it's like a song cycle it doesn't really have like hits that jump yeah. out i mean it's it's just there's it's so theatrical at moments that it's like i don't know it's 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 a lot I, I guess that's the way i can round it up but i do love that about it is that it's it's a lot but i don't i feel like i don't follow back and like revisit that record a lot yeah i do appreciate that they threw in some like uh some more adventurous moments like the end of lauren i think is semi-challenging for uh, a band of prince daddy's like genre and level um right. of popularity like i every time i listen to it, i'm like but there's no i forgot to take my bets today there's no like anthem i don't know i i feel like it, this is going to be a record that because another thing was with the first lp i listened to it when it came out and i didn't really get into it until like late 2017 so i feel like this might be a record that you know in the coming months that i'll probably revisit and maybe get more into but i feel like i feel like i also just haven't given it the the amount of listens it probably deserves yeah i mean i think with this record like i didn't i didn't listen to it a whole lot admittedly but like with with records like where there's not really a whole thing of an anthem they already put out like this album that lots of people like has some really anthemic songs so like if they're touring this album you know people are going to want to hear the anthems so if you write a second album that has all these songs that you're you know are like really anthemic it's going to be like hard to come up with like a good set list i don't know like i've I've had this problem before like where i i write something new and i'm like i want to play all this new stuff i mean i think i think they did a good move for for like their their, their next record well, the thing they were doing when they first started touring on it was they were playing, like, 
cosmic thrill seekers all the way through and then doing like a little greatest hit set at the end i think for uh an album that is as fo as, as focused on how everything comes together as cosmic thrill seekers is kind of the move i really like full album shows and then by the time i saw them uh they had moved on to basically doing like entirely request only shows <laughs> it was just like 19 songs of people like just shouting shit out from the audience that's pretty <laughs> sick all right the other big dog is pitchfork's favorite emo band oh so oh so basking in the glow best new music on pitchfork like a let me get like a 9.1 or something that is wild yep. to me because unihon mixtape is like one of my favorite emo records of maybe all time like i i feel like that is one record i come back to on a weekly basis and have been for like the last two years and basking in the glow i don't know i mean jade definitely has like ways of writing songs where it's like you hear it and you're like oh that's a you know a formulaic oh so oh so song but I don't know, there was just something about Unihon mixtape that Basking in the Glow didn't have for me, personally. And I'm not, I can't, I don't even know if I can put my finger on, like, what it was, because I don't, I don't think I listened to Basking in the Glow, you know, nearly as many times as I listened to Unihon mixtape. So obviously this record was, like, big, otherwise it wouldn't be, like, in the big dog category, but I'm surprised it wasn't, like, kind of, like, a mainstream sort of breakthrough for Oso Oso, like... Just considering how much hype Unihon had behind it, and they moved to a bigger label, and uh, the songwriting took like a much more polished step forward. The songs are also super, super accessible. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. really dumb. It it was the the bleed American moment for Oso Oso, I think, or I felt like it was kind of supposed to be that. Unihon is the clarity; it's the cult classic. Uh, but I was expecting this to be, be like a fucking huge record. I'm not gonna say it like fell short of expectations uh, musically because it's like a really easy, fun listen. But it, it does seem weird to me that it didn't like blow up. I feel like there were also like a lot of challenging moments that uh, Unihon mixtape didn't necessarily have. You know, like kind of like the ending part in Dig, where it just like. It kind of like re like it kind of visits like a whole new I don't know it's I feel like that was like one of the first times I've heard Oso oh like really get away from like the indie pop vibe and you know get into something like more posty and and uh, atmospheric so I don't know I'm, I'm pretty excited to see what's up with the next record I don't know they got a they got a great team behind behind the scenes too so I mean and, and seemingly they can just like pump out music so oh I'm yeah they have next. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, this definitely became, like, every music journalist's favorite emo album of the year, and I guess that kind of took my eyes away from everyone online who was saying stuff, and I think, I, like, personally, I think Unihan is, is still my favorite, but, Oh, like, for sure. Yeah, but yeah, but Basking in the Glow, I, I feel like they're interchangeable, like, like, I don't think they sound that much different. I think, I mean, I think the production sounds, like, that's where... It kind of lost me, and one of the things I really love about Unihon Mixtape is it's it's this feeling of, of seeing this band that, like, I've seen in Basement since, like, 2016, and they they have, they kind of, like, push off the same vibe that they have live. It's not saying it's not polished, but, like, I don't know. I feel that's that's one thing that Bastion and Glow really went over and, and over-polished some things that, like, sure. I kind of sure. feel like I hear, oh, so I'm like, wow, this kind of makes them sound like a stadium band rather than you know the band that I I grew to love seeing and play in front of like twenty five people in basements. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that's I, also like I, part of growth, and I, I I you know I love to see that. And I feel like they've opened for every possible big emo band. Like they did Manchester yeah, Orchestra, they've done Joyce Manor, they've done Tiny Moving Parts. But I, I don't know. That's the I, I really I really want to see them push and do something crazy. Yeah, same like, here. Hopefully we'll get that. But I mean I would love to see them open up for like jimmy world or or someone who was like really big back in like the mid-2000s because like that's where that band sounds from Mm -hmm. oh yeah for sure i wish they were on that uh the hella mega tour (laughs) (laughs) all right we got to get into the medium dogs then let's do it all right these albums all had like above 20 ish votes which is good for this because small dogs had like not 10 uh and then puppies all had like one or two votes so this is a a substantial category which both of your albums are in 
All right. <laughs> Not even emo. Shmoney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Shin Guard and Short Fictions are in the same category as American Football LP3. All right. Dang. Oh, right. I'm gonna say three. I thought that came out in like 2017. I, I yeah. yeah. <laughs> LP three was way better than LP two. Oh, I, I agree. I listened to I listened to like the first single from LP two, and I was like, nah. And then I remember hearing the thing with Haley Williams, which felt like came out in like 2017, but I guess it was early last year. I think yeah, someone I leaked it yeah. in like December yeah. of 2018. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, this album was uh. I think my my standards for them were so low after LP2 that I was like, this is going to be complete garbage. And it was, like, okay. And I was like, well, damn. Yeah. I was going to say, it makes sense. It was, like, the probably the best album that they could, like, put out. Like, I don't know, they're, what, all, like, in their 40s now. Yeah, yeah but, like, I mean, in the last 10 years, I'm, like, Mike Kinsella has proven himself to be in some very sick emo bands that... You know, I listen to or yeah, revisit, true. you know, way more than I do with American football, especially like, you know, There, There, There is like one of the craziest bands I've ever heard. And Owen is something I even listen to more than American football. I'm Owen. <laughs> you are? <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, no, I was going to say like the opener on the the latest American football album was so beautiful. It's and all the features good. are great. It's like so the good. the worst track on it is like I mean I don't even remember like what the worst track of it cuz it's like it's a pretty consistent album. Yeah, I uh it's, it's what LP2 should have been. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. yeah, LP2 was incredibly weak in my personal opinion. Uh, I had some friends that liked it, just I could never honestly back it. I don't know, I just wasn't my thing but i remember hearing silhouettes like for the very first time and being like okay like damn this is it chief like they they did it right this time so yeah i really enjoyed this record i thought it was pretty good i was just gonna say wouldn't it be great if we put out this episode and just said featuring owen and everyone thought we had mike Kinsella on <laughs> you should probably do that yeah <laughs> Uh, so LP3, it's not my favorite American football release, but it is my favorite American football album, uh, I think. I'm kind of um, surprised to hear you say that, Ellie. Oh, you like the EP the most? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the EP is my favorite American football record. But this is, uh, th this I think is like their most consistently engaging album, uh, with the most cohesive, uh, focused songwriting. And, uh, like everyone else has said, it's really pretty. Uh, all the features are really good. So I went and saw Heart Attack Man and Sincere Engineer, and literally the exact same night in the same venue, but in the big room instead of the small room, American football was playing. Yeah, I felt I felt very true and cult for going to see the, the show in the small room next to American football. And it kind of like threw everything out of whack for me because I was like, Jesus Christ, this band that played like six shows from 1998 to 1999 is now playing like the the big room of a venue while i go and see like another band in a smaller venue that american football wouldn't even have filled when they were around we and we talked a little bit about this when we did the the top 100 emo songs list but american football's ascent to being kings of emo it will always be baffling to me um but i i absolutely do not hate this record i think it was uh, a good step forward for them their house looks stupid <laughs> we saw me and ryan went and saw it in person when we went on a tour in 2017 2018 or something like that and i think and we we flipped off the house it was great <laughs> the house means nothing to me I don't care about the house. I'm going to be honest. I kissed the house. It was pretty sick. I enjoyed being there. <laughs> yeah. um, next up, we have Shin Guard 2020. Which, so, Shit album? So, Owen, how do you feel about being on an emo list? I feel embarrassed, but then, I don't know, Like when, before I put that out, I was like, man, I really hope my album gets gets mentioned on the E word. And it, no, it, it's super dope. So I, I, I mean, if it's if it's on a list with other good albums, then that's that's good to me. I mean, to to be fair, is crazy and off the wall is and not emo as twenty twenty was. I mean, just merely two releases ago, Shingard was pretty much an emo band. 
we were like pop punk. Pop like punk, it was yeah. sort of pop ridiculous. Punk, baby. Yeah. Yeah, y'all were y'all were literally doing like defend pop punk stuff. Like yeah. I know it was kind of it was kind of sick. <laughs> <laughs> our our character arc is is just all over the place. Like it's, I mean, our, we're not even doing screamo anymore for the 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 next stuff we're doing. Like beatdown, right? Yeah. Damn, it's it's cool. like beatdown with some weird shit. It's it's like wild to see the change that you guys had because like I remember I mean like Sam had booked your guys first show at Verona and I was he was like sick or something or away and I I ran your guys first show and it was like bonkers to see the change that you guys have had since the very first time like I ever saw you play to like where you are now it's like crazy like I you guys are just absolutely in, insane musicians and uh and amazing people too i mean you guys are my best friends so uh oh, thank you That's yeah very kind. Uh, pittsburgh got a lot of love and uh it's it's very cool that multiple bands who are also like really good friends in real life and roommates i mean shingar like i live dicks like in the room next to me and uh owen lived with sam for a minute it's in the it's in the pittsburgh blood it's in the water the yeah. Yin's town. Yin's town, baby. <laughs> you guys ever play with Code Orange? <laughs> Yo, Sam actually just got a text from uh, somebody in Code Orange the other day. I guess uh, they need their tapes like made because I guess the tape companies are like backed up, and they're like, "Hey, we uh, got your number off of somebody. Could you make all of the uh, Code Orange tapes for us?" <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Sam, the, the next Aren't text, it was like a Roadrunner, and Sam yeah. goes, "The hardcore band," and they go, "Yep." And then Sam was like, all right, I'm going to make 200 tapes for the Code Orange. <laughs> That's sick. That's sick. That doesn't That's get the same. I don't know what will. Uh, I think it's pretty well documented that Kyle and I both fucking love this record. And as far as character arcs go, I think Shingard is like the fucking Sasuke of DIY. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep getting more and more deadly with every release. So the goal, our yeah. next album is a laxative. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find the brown note? <laughs> yeah. Are you going full Emir worship? Is this is like a it's it's almost like a, a whole nother band like this next album like it's not going to be remotely screamo at all. I I don't know. It's going to be sick. I'm feeling really confident about it. And with this quarantine, like we have more time to to work on it. So, that's cool. Uh next up we're going international. I love your lifestyle the movie. This album is really fucking good, and I this don't know if a lot of people cheated, heard it. Right? I definitely did not hear this. I this band, this, Sam bumps this band in the in the van, or at least yeah. was like the last two tours. They're from uh, are they from Sweden? Yeah, or, like, yeah. Denmark. Yep. Gothenburg. They uh they remind me a lot of uh the band Forest, uh, yep. who's also in the Small Dogs list. So I guess we'll talk about them in a minute. But uh yeah, I don't know. I I feel like it's a uh, this record was like super clean. Yeah, this is a this is a really like tight record. Actually, like the thing that it it brought to my mind most was like a much more cleanly produced version of the first High Tide Hotel EP or sorry LP. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel that. I I don't know what made me get into this band. It was probably Sam, but they haven't toured like the U.S. recently, have they? I don't think so. Hmm, well, no, I don't think so. I yeah. love your lifestyle. If you're listening, hit me up. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm too busy. I'll listen to your Maybe. record. Sorry, I haven't yet. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's it's pretty good. It's yeah. They're just like a clean. They got the ramen riffs. Yum yum. It's time to talk Glass Beach, the first Glass Beach album. This uh, band is ridiculous. I've been listening to Glass Beach for like the last two months, like since we played with them. I don't think I listened to them. I don't think I listened to the record before, like Gami and Short Fictions played with them in L.A. Like, it was literally the most ridiculous show I've ever played, and, uh... Yeah, that shit was bonkers. Yeah, that record that record goes hard, and I'm super stoked. I'm I'm gonna be uh, working with them this year, hopefully, if they play shows. Yeah, why, yeah. why haven't they toured or anything, really? I, I don't know. I talked to Jamie Coletta, who is, like, there are no earbuds band. Jamie does great work. Jamie hit me up. Or maybe I hit Jamie up. I don't know. I love this record. I love this band. It... It sounds amazing live. So, I don't know. I feel like this is a band that a lot of people need to see live. Like, I mean, the record is great, but I feel like live, it's a whole other experience. Mm -hmm. I, I do feel like I need to see this band live, uh, if only to, like, finally understand why everyone is telling me why I should love them. What don't you like about the record? It reminds me of, like, 
I mean, Brave Little Abacus is like the one Brave of my Little Abacus all time. <laughs> I I just I see it. I, I feel it in the record, like pretty much all throughout. Even like, have you heard? Has anyone here heard Cassio Dad? Like the yeah, Cassio Dad did like a BLA cover. Yeah, I mean they're like it's, so they're definitely influenced by yeah. by. Yeah, I thought I thought it was a really good record. I was gonna say like most of these records, I I, I really fell out of touch with emo. So like this is like one of the few albums that I was like definitely like few emo albums I was definitely bumping. I think it's dope because it's like it's sort of like I mean it's not BLA like I, I I think it's different from BLA but it it it's sort of bringing some of that energy back like the the really ambitious uh sort of emo and then there's some like Beach Boys type stuff in there mm-hmm. and I think you may not you may not like how they like pulled it off but someone's gonna listen to that and bring that level of ambition to their band and oh, oh yeah for cool. sure as much as i personally am not into it because i the first time i listened to it i listened to it in the car um and i was like this really isn't hitting me and then i listened to it on a headphone the second time and i was like this hit me a little bit more but it's still not really my thing uh but i do think that they are like the crest of like a, a new wave that's happening in emo because they are doing like innovative interesting shit and um i think more more bands could take a cue from going all out like and being quote unquote too much you know like i i we need more like overwhelming songwriting and emo oh definitely and also like i mean they they don't seem to like tour a whole lot i don't know how often they play shows but i'd imagine like the more that they play shows and like build more of a chemistry like i think the next thing that they'll do it'll probably be just as ambitious if not more and then they'll have potentially more chemistry with each other so i'm really excited for what they have in store i think like all the instruments are like very fucking tight like the bass is insane like the guitar is insane like i think like uh jay put out like a tab book for it and people were like what the fuck are these chords even like they're like all like made up or something like that it's like um, galaxy brain chords. yeah uh i uh so william the drummer from glass beach uh they just hit me up to uh take drum set lessons uh from me which is pretty sick huh. um but they're a uh, super absolutely incredible musician um it's cool because they have this mindset of like they want to serve the music as best as possible which is a really rad mindset for drummers to have because, you know, I feel like a lot of drummers have this whole idea of, like, they need to play the most complex and, like, flashy shit, uh, you know, just to show off. But I feel like true, I don't know, musical maturity is in the playing what the right thing is in the right time. And uh, William definitely uh, has that. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. They're great. Super Yeah, cool. I think... One of the cool things, like, about that band is, like, just, like, the... There's a lot of tongue-in-cheek lyricism, but also just, like, the way a lot of that record moves. And it's... it's That's another one that's, like, super long, but unlike Cosmic Thrill Seekers that I just get, like... It's, like, almost too long. Like, Glass Beach just finds a way to just, like, keep me enticed every time I feel, like, a little bit slowed down. And I think... I think Classic J, Dies and Goes to Hell, is, like, one of my favorite openings to a record in quite some time. So, I don't know, yeah. I, feel, I feel like that band is going to absolutely blow up after, you know, the touring gets there. But I, I, my goal is definitely to have, like, everyone who can in America see that band. Because it's, I think that will, like, listening to the record is like, okay, maybe I get this. And then seeing the band live and seeing their chemistry on stage with each other, it's like, that's like one of the things where you're like, oh, shit, I get it. And if there's anyone like really into this record, Run for Cover put out like an hour and a half documentary where this band goes in and talks like in depth song for song, which is like kind of cool if you if you're really trying to like dive in and and see like how the band came together and like wrote that record. That could have been oh, us yeah. if you voted for them, people. <laughs> <laughs> and the last medium dog. Short fictions, fates worth and death. And sucks. I dope band. I feel really fucking bad for like not being able to premiere the short fictions track. Like, uh, I mean, it like everything with this record happened how it should have, and 
you know, I, I'm really fucking... I, this record that Sam wrote was, like, super important, and some of these songs, like, Property of Pigeons has been being played since, like, well before Ryan and I were even, like, involved in the band at all. I don't know. It's This record is just so long in the making and has such an important voice to it that's, like, whether we're playing in front of, like, 15 kids in a basement or, you know, opening up for a bigger band like Gami and playing in front of like a hundred to 200 a night. I mean, we're going to go out every night and still uh, scream the same message just because, you know, now we finally have like after Sam started the band, what, right in like 2015. So it's like, yeah. Sam's been working really hard to get this, you know, platform to say some really important shit. And I think that like, I think this record did. And like, I don't know, the record talks about the world ending, which is Literally pretty applicable to now. <laughs> yeah. So it, mm-hmm, like, yeah. even if I wasn't in the band, this record would be, like, one of my favorites probably ever. I feel like this record, like, makes me feel... Like, even when Sam sent me the demos, like, two years ago now, it's like, I heard these and I was like, damn, like, this record has made me feel, like, the way, like, three or four other records really have. So, Sam, I know you're listening. Thank you for letting me be involved <laughs> in your band. To say, uh, those songs have been around for a while and it's great now that they're like immortalized in this dope album and like i mean i've been seeing yins for like so like three years like you got so much tighter as a band and like seeing your come up's been really awesome highly regarded band in pittsburgh really good really good stuff yeah i don't know i feel like our band overcame a lot like prior to this record coming out like over the oh, last definitely year. so yeah. it's just like we're going through a lot of shit like everyone in the band and uh like chaos i'm excited sure. that the record came out when it did because like if this if we had waited like another six months and this is like when the record would be coming out i, I would be like heartbroken and i don't know our band we just all love each other so much and it's it's just more of like a family than like i feel like i've ever had i'm very very thankful that like people even like listen to the record that ian cohen listened to the record that like we have had the ability to just like go on tour and like we'll buy our merch and yeah this record is uh the three big e's it's uh environmentalist existential emo um a lyric as far as lyrical concerns goes uh y'all are familiar with uh snag right yeah Mm -hmm. yeah like definitely like treads in that same territory of just like uh extremely anxious mindfulness um but like just on a musical level i feel like there's like a kaleidoscope of influences um and the songs all go every which way uh but it it it's tight it's cohesive um and it's just like a roller coaster ride of an album i i fucking loved it personally i'll have from the second that i i got the I got the leak from Alex Martin. Yeah. <laughs> I think from from we're Amart. Really uh, surprised by the next release. Yeah, I so when this when we were recording this record, it was a it was chaos. It was pure chaos, honestly. And uh, I was kind of super iffy uh, and nervous about this record for sure. Um, but I remember when we got the final masters back, I felt very confident in it, and I was like, you know, I actually can. You know, I, I'm proud of this record and, you know, Sam's writing and everything. I mean, absolutely uh, amazing uh, writer and musician. Yeah, the, you know, uh, this is the first record I ever played on. This record has a very special place in my heart for sure. Yeah, I don't know. Love it a lot. <laughs> Small dogs. Small dogs time. <laughs> uh, we kick off with Somo's Prison on a Hill, which ba- basically what? encompass this record unfortunately was the death of the guitarist right mm-hmm. yeah. yeah yeah i think they like put it out it's early and donated a lot of money to the family and also of course tiny engines kind of went away as well i yeah, think I, I, there's yeah. a lot of un- unfortunate circumstances around this album i mean even with that being said it's still it still sounds and feels like a so much record i don't think i listened to the so much record that came out in 2016 i think i the only full length prior to this that i heard was the like that first LP that came out in 2014. I feel like I might have like missed a transition because it feels much more new wave than past almost releases. Yeah. I was going to say, I really dug like the, the like kind of like the eighties edge that they put on it. 
it kind of just adds to like uh i i feel like uh new order might be like kind of like an off comparison um but i do get like a similar vibe and that it's like a lot of like just like cold beauty on this record it, it it's very mournful and yet it feels like a blanket yeah this, yeah. Record, this record was sad just in like every aspect of like from songwriting to like you know how it came out but i don't know i'm i'm and i'm wondering what's going to happen around the next whatever happens with everyone in somos going forward but yeah. i mean everyone in that band's like older right i feel like they're all you know that band started like 2011 so i feel like they all have to be you know almost i feel like it's yeah. so it's so hard to like go on and like do stuff i mean i don't know if i i don't think i'll ever tour in a band after a short fiction so it's like i can't even imagine having to like go through a loss like that and then try to like start up a new band following them yeah, yeah. And I, this this is also a comeback album because they broke up between yeah, albums exactly 16, right yeah yeah, yeah. mental health hiatus yeah and they they always stuck out to me as one of the bands that was was just really really honest about having mental health struggles like uh yeah even more so than modern baseball they were just like really face forward about it and really encouraging of people to just be honest about their issues and get help i mean i i think that message like resonates with this album more than any other of theirs next up forest spending eternity in a japanese convenience store this definitely hit like my end of year top 10 i really 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 like this record i think avery from retirement party got me onto this record i think like they stayed over after they played in pittsburgh and they're like yeah you need to listen to this record and then i did and then worst party ever was like yo we want to do this tour um we want to bring our friends over from singapore and i was like okay who is it and he's like it's forests and i was like dope so we booked a whole tour this summer a whole ass us tour that's just gonna get scrapped which Shit. is oh, like ridiculous. I, I thought i thought it was very I'm cool to back here like as soon as possible because this record's amazing i don't know if anyone listened to the new single that came out dakota that's yeah, awesome. yeah 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 Shit, that that fucking sucks about the tour spending I mean, eternity I mean, in a just, coronavirus quarantine yeah it'll happen it'll happen again like i'm i'm sure this band has like this band really wants to get over here and like I don't know. I don't know what touring is like in in Singapore, really. Or I know they've toured Japan quite a few times, but I don't know. I I really feel like people fuck with them over here. They have the capacity to really break through over here, uh, not just because their songs are catchy, which they are, but also because like their musicianship is just off the fucking charts, doing some crazy innovative shit that uh, I haven't heard in emo since like cattle drum let me remind you that this is also a three-piece band yeah it's not fun yeah i was gonna say they're i liked uh i think the song this town needs fun that was like a pretty cool song the guitar parts are cool yeah they're doing a lot they're gonna do some cool stuff they're doing a lot of cool shit i know that they're uh you know getting ready to line up a new release at some point this year i hope it doesn't get pushed back from coronavirus that that's a record that like I, i think is really fun and uh something that that emo hasn't seen for a minute like ellie was saying yeah i think uh if the band keeps like pushing in the direction that they started with this album they could like become a full-on psych emo band yeah That'd be super cool <laughs> who would uh who would like if they came to the u.s and toured with like a bigger band who would you like to see them opening up for in like a 500 to like thousand cap room I think it would be really cool to see them with maybe like one of the one of the post hardcore bands that's kind of like vibing right now. Like I think it'd be really fucking cool to see them on a tour with like Drug Church. That would be I so think. sick. Yeah, I that, think that, I think the that's like I think the vibe would blow people's minds. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I feel I feel like they have you know not being a post band at all. They have like they have so much intensity with like none of that coming from like a distortion end in the record. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I really, really fucked with that record. <laughs> like they, and it's not like they're heavy at all. But I could see like people crowd killing to the Twinkles. Well, <laughs> nuts. It's, it's a really fun record to like, just like close your eyes and like visualize the guitar too. I was gonna say good tone, for sure. It's just very, very cute sounding stuff. I like it. Hell yeah, uh, Macasal, as you have written here. No, um, <laughs> that's <Seal>. funny. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, this is the first Max Seal LP, right? Like they put out three EPs. Yeah, 
I don't know how I feel about this record. I feel like it wasn't something I like came back to a lot. I do remember like like there were the singles I remember being super catchy and then I remember liking some of the songs that weren't as single like that weren't released as singles because they had a lot of like callback to old Max Seal stuff with a lot of like the you know the tappy and the pull-offs and a lot of stuff that they haven't really revisited since like the first or second Max Seal release. Yeah, so this uh, this is not like a sonic comparison because I don't think the two bands sound very similar. But I feel like with this record, Max Seal kind of pulled a knuckle puck, where they released like a bunch of like super fucking sick EPs and built up a ton of LP hype, and then the LP uh, kind of fell flat for me. Hmm. I'm not think... into Copacetic. Ellie, <laughs> no, no, uh, Copacetic had like some of the the worst fucking english major lyrics i've ever heard in my life <laughs> more like co-pathetic am i right <laughs> no, just kidding i haven't listened to it for the things that i took away from this record that i felt like i didn't really get from maxio was like this felt like the fullest maxio has sounded like i feel the first the first couple releases except for like the last the first ep that was released on 6131 i feel like was their most overly produced Mm -hmm. release and i feel like this kind of went back to some of the like the last over produced stuff which um i like and i feel like this band did like a lot of touring last year too I oh yeah for sure with them, like, three times they did a big tour with uh free throw they were like oh, the opener on it that's right and i remember they came through with like i'm glad it's you yep yes that tour played the diy hardcore venue uh in austin <laughs> Yeah, I Which mean, I, I, thought was I, I do. I, I really enjoy seeing Max Seal live, and I, I think, uh, I think the record, the record's just very mellow. And seeing them live, I don't know. I feel like that adds a lot to it. But I, I think I could definitely say that I, I enjoyed hearing the songs live more than I did like on record. I like it just as much as yeah, no, I know. I think like I listen to this album like a strange amount, like like a, like a lot, a lot, and I don't know why. I think it was just kind of comforting to listen to. I I I think it's very fucking good. What was your favorite uh, song from it? The one where the chorus is like Harry. I don't know uh, what song oh, that. I don't uh, know which one that's I, called. I never think that song called Harry. I think the thing I like about Max Seal is like all their songs are like ridiculously catchy, and also just like, like you know exactly what's oh, coming. Oh fuck! Next. That's not even on this album. My bad. Uh, Always Hate You is my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think Mr. Ink's my favorite one because that's that's the most riffy thing yeah. on this record. And this record just all in all feels like an indie pop record more than anything else. Yeah, I think like the way that's produced definitely does sound like that. I think a thing that I really like in emo is like multiple vocalists, and they've got that co-vocalist and co and co-songwriter thing that I think really uh, makes it more engaging to listen to. An album I haven't listened to, Time Moving Parts, Breathe. Let's I just gave... skip this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's go to the puppies. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, uh, the puppies, these all got like one one to two votes. Um, there's some really good albums in here. Insignificant Other, I'm So Glad. Great album. Yep, Counter, I'm not counter really Intuitive Release. One, two votes. Yeah, this I know. It's better than Emo. I think it's my favorite Counter Intuitive album. Like, yeah, I, I don't I, know, it's just super catchy and the little vocal rounds on the first song it's really good i mean this album's emo adjacent right i believe so yeah uh John this, this album starts off like really pop punky i think and then it kind of like flows into the more emo adjacent territory yeah. and the song freya has some like interesting use of uh, electronics on it it's just a I, I think it's just like a really fun record but I wasn't I wasn't huge on it. The record I was huge on though is definitely Tiny Moving Parts Breathe, fucking best album of twenty nineteen, in my opinion. <laughs> Up there with Blink 182's California. Oh Nine. Hell no. <laughs> uh yeah, I don't know. Insiggy is one of like my favorite live bands I've ever seen. I don't know. Has anyone here seen Insignificant Other Live? No. I've, I've always missed the chance to see them. I'm so bummed. They're another band that we had hella stuff booked this year, this summer, and everything is scrapped. So, I have no idea when they're going to be coming through, but they're on Fest this year, which is sick. They're from Florida, right? Yeah, they're a Gainesville band, actually. Yeah, I'll see. They're in Birmingham now, but... Yeah, I was going to say, uh, they, were, they were there when, when we came through Birmingham in January. 
Yeah, I was I was gonna say I think actually like it's significant other feels very much like what what a fest band would be like if like the style of fest hadn't stagnated over the last twenty or so years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, like I can def- I can definitely hear like discount and like mid to late period hot water music in their sound. Sorry, I just said that their their dogs are so cute. <laughs> um, oh yeah, they are. You know, there's this cute one dogs. dog, it, like its little tongue sticks out. It's just so freaking cute. You know, it's it's awesome. All right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, free throw. What's past is prologue. Um, I think a lot of people have jumped ship on free throw. I think this is way better than the album before it, uh, but it's still just like about a six out of ten for me. Yeah, I didn't really care for this album. Yeah, this album. I've, kind I've of never shit. listened to them before, <laughs> so I I listened to this for the first time yesterday. I barely made it through the whole thing. It's uh, it's an exhausting record. <laughs> it's really a shame because Free Throw had such fucking promise. Early EPs and the first LP just like have so much energy and potential. It's like essential emo. Uh, yeah, yeah. It just uh, it, it they they saw like kind of like the dip in DIY that was happening from like 2015 to 2018, and they were like, okay, let's let's just like ride the wave and become pop punk. And it, it it just hasn't worked out for them songwriting wise, um, but I w- I will say they are definitely still better than Hot Mulligan. <laughs> oh yeah, Alex, remember when you were like begging me to play drums for Jimmy Mayo so you guys could open for Hot Mulligan, and I yeah, re- and guess also- what we <laughs> did, and it was sick. Yeah, that's. I'm pretty sure we're the best band on that bill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did I play that? No, I think Mark was. Uh, yeah, no. I cannot believe this was a band that was on Count Your Lucky Stars in 2014. Oh my god, yeah. 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 That's, that's literally all I have to say about this record. Sam sure. saw this band in 2014. I don't think I've ever seen them live. I've seen them yeah. so many times. Uh, they definitely went from a Count Your Lucky Stars band to a band that sounds like they would be on drive through Records in 2005. Ellie, can you just get because I I I don't even think I understand why, but like, what is your big hatred for Hot Mulligan? It's not necessarily even that they are bad because I remember liking like the first EP that they did, and I was like, oh shit, this might actually lead to like Easy Core Revival, but clearly that ended up becoming Gami's Lane. Um, but <laughs> I, I, like. They they just kept like putting out songs that were less engaging and less engaging, and then I got dragged to uh, to to see them and they their stage okay. banter was like really broy and weird, um, and they had like a lot of energy but it just was not translating to to me in the crowd, and then I listen to their latest album and i was like okay this is like fully whack (laughs) is is this album that they just put out their second one they're like second full length yeah okay i think i might have heard the first full length and i was like this is just the wonder years this is like straight up just the wonder years blueprint oh but it's not the wonder years were like a really fucking good band for the longest time well musically Um, yeah, I, I guess I could see it. Ian Cohen just put out that that new Hot Mulligan review and compared the vocals to Jesse Lacey and Dan from The Wonder Years, and it, it made me feel very sad. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mover Shaker. <laughs> this, this record makes me really fucking excited for whatever the next Mover Shaker album is going to be. I felt like this was like a huge step up from what I've heard of their earlier material. The production is like really messy and chaotic, but in a good way. And the songs just like are nonstop. Like it just feels like breathless. Um, yeah, it's I had very a, intricate. I thought, yeah. Mm-hmm. There are some crazy ballads on this stuff. Like some stuff that I, I heard and I was like, damn, this reminds me of like Queen ballads. Yeah. I don't know, the musicianship is great. This is another record that you know, much like P. Daddy was like three years in the making. So I don't know. I I, I kind of wish there was like, I felt like there should have been more hype around it. I kind of just like snuck out on Skeletal Lightning. Like there was really no mm. big press around it. They got to do a 
audio tree, which is really cool because, I don't know, I feel like that's a good way that with all the touring not going on that people can really uh, dive into those songs. Yeah, they're so tight live. Like, definitely you see them live if you had the chance. Like, I, I definitely think this album should have gotten more hype too because it's, again, it's one of those very, like, intricate, impressive, ambitious albums that will inspire people to to try harder. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like for a long time, Uber Shaker has been, like, your favorite band's favorite band. I, I mean, I feel like it could just come, like, any day now with this record that someone could just be like, yo, this is the next big record. And they could, I feel like this band could, they're so versatile, they could literally go out of with anyone. Yeah, they're, like, making a hardcore album, I heard. Yeah, yeah, they're pulling a <laughs> pool. <gonna> sick. <laughs> I was gonna say, everyone should just stop doing emo. Go make this podcast <laughs> to the H word. Let's go. Uh, that I've been trying to do that since fucking 2016. All right. All are right. we? Are we move on? Yeah. Future yeah. teens breakup season. I've unfortunately only listened to this album once, and it was on the day that it came out. <laughs> but it's uh, very catchy. I thought you you shouted it out in your favorite albums of last year. No, that was Tyler. Jesus Christ. Uh, but I, I, just because of that, I like revisited it and it's very, very fun. Like, just g- good, no frills, catchy indie rock. It appealed to me greatly. Yeah, I, I feel like this band is, uh, I feel like every, every week they get announced another big tour with like whatever band is like on top. I mean, they, I think they've toured with, the Wonder Years like multiple times and now they're going out with uh, Spanish Love Songs who mm. you know, put out like that big record I, w- I mean I wouldn't be surprised to see them do something like ridiculously crazy in the fall um, yeah wasn't that tour Future Teen Spanish Love Songs and Pop be- very big tour for them yeah anyone else listen to it <laughs> I didn't listen to it <laughs> no, I didn't listen guilty to it. <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah, it's very pleasure. it's very well produced it sounds great yeah um I listened to it in the car with Dina, and she didn't like the vocals, but uh, I actually like the vocals a whole lot. <laughs> really, like, half the time I talk about albums on this podcast, like, I, I just mentioned what Dina thought about it and where I disagree. <laughs> She's the third co-host. I like opinions. Yeah, she really is. I have not heard this next one, a Weather Day, come in. Did Me I just, either. like, miss something? Or is this oh, someone that... Re- I think they're a, they're a band from... Sweden. Sweden? They're... They're sick. I, I think they remind me a lot of, uh, like, Glass Beach. Uh, like, kind of. I didn't I didn't even know this band existed until... Wait, Anthony know, Fantano reviewed this album. Right? Oh, shit, dude. <laughs> um, so, Weather Day is a, a project by uh, someone I am friends with on Discord named Sputnik. Um, <laughs> and their entire persona, everything from, like, the music to their appearance, is just, like, androgynous alien angel. I I really feel like the Glass Beach comparison is on point, but I like this way more than Glass Beach because uh, it's the production is much like fuzzier and deliberately challenging and lo-fi, uh, and the but the songs just like are so catchy that they like break through the the fuzz. Like I remember reading like a ton of reviews of like '90s indie rock bands where they would say, "Oh, these are fractured pop songs." <laughs> But the, this actually is like the fractured pop song thesis uh, come to life. And Sputnik also does an electronic solo project called Lola's Pocket PC that I highly recommend everyone check out. Um, I'm really excited to see what this band does next. Are they doing anything else this year that you know of? There's a, there's a, there's a demo for a new song that I've heard that's really good. Um, but... Uh, I I just really think that what they're doing is very unique within the scene, and uh, I am excited for them to blow the fuck up. Can't believe I didn't know who this band was until yesterday. Cool. And then I added on a special care special category of why anyone vote for these because they're obviously big records for the scene, but did not get a single vote. One of those is Wicca Phase, one of those is Greet Death, and one of those is Law Dispute. Ryan's about to go, go off on a lot of spew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would definitely go ham on that record. <laughs> <laughs> so, personally, when that record first came out, it just... So, a lot of spew is my favorite band, uh, and it didn't grab me at, at all. I really didn't like it. Um, but the more I started listening to it, the more it started to grow on me. Now, I think it is an absolutely uh, a, an incredible record. 
Um, and I think it's just like a kind of a follow up to Rooms in the House too. Like I just, or it is Rooms in the House too, basically. I don't know. I just think that the theme on this record is absolutely incredible. I mean, a lot of speakers always had incredible themes on all of their records. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I think this was a great record as of right now. Super good. <laughs> I don't think I listened to this record. I think yeah. I listened to it once. I gave it a once. I I don't like this record. A lot of speed sounds like Hobo Johnson. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. I only really care for wildlife. I you say that. <laughs> I will say though that I I don't listen to this record. I really don't even listen to a lot of speed that much anymore. But especially if I had to pick the record I would like the least, it would be this one for sure. But I still do like it. Um. Yeah. This record just kind of felt like. Uh... A lot of speed fully transitioning into uh, like a legacy band. Their time of vitality has passed. It's weird because they're really good friends with Touche, but Touche keeps putting out records that feel like very fresh and visceral and in, in the moment. But a lot of speed, uh, and not to not to like bag on their approach to songwriting because I I do appreciate that it feels very considered and. Um, Everything seems to be like well thought out and well paced, but it just does not. It, it doesn't feel like necessary to me. Yeah, no, and I totally understand that. They had a their guitarist Kevin left the band right after Rooms of the House, um, and he was kind of like honestly the main musical uh, uh, contributor to that band. Uh, he he basically wrote like everything. So when with him leaving, uh, I feel like that definitely, uh, you know, affected uh, their songwriting a lot. So slightly disappointed for sure. Yeah, Jordan Dreyer's still a cutie though. <laughs> oh, absolutely! Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I really like the album cover. Yeah, it's cool. It's the best part of the album. <laughs> uh, Great death. I've told Ellie this and I think I said on the on the end of the year episode but I think that album is gonna be like a classic in like four or five years yeah I think I think this is gonna be like the hotel years no place I, I don't know I think this record is just like <clears throat> excuse me like everything that they did in their prior record which I think was called Dixieland yes everything that they did in that record they just took it and turned it up to like absolute max on this next record mm -hmm. uh, and they're another like band that has an audio tree that just like absolutely blew me away yeah and i wish same. they on that whole record on the audio tree because like you know that record being an hour long that's another one that like i just i feel like i need to listen to that record the whole way through it it, it feels like i don't know why but it, it reminds me of just like explosions in the sky not in the sense of music at all but just like in the sense of how that record flows so softly and then just like punches you in the face and then yeah you know back to just like I cannot believe no one voted for this record. I, it, it's very head-scratching to me. Um, yeah. So I saw comments on their audio tree that kind of made me upset, but I also, like, see them now. Like, So someone was like, this band is just a carbon copy of... Um... Cloakroom? Yes. And I was like, yeah. oh, God, they're right. That's <laughs> sort of what I... Was felt. it you? I mean, I thought it was, like, Were you the one album. commenting? I didn't comment. I I am not one of those types of people. But the comparison, you you could definitely tell they take influence from Cloakroom. That's like when I listened to this album, it was like it was like pretty okay, but it just like <laughs> put me in a Cloakroom mood. But like the person was like, no, they are using the same bass rig as the guy in Cloakroom now. But either, either way, I like Great Death more than Cloakroom. Oh no, I love Cloakroom so much. I don't love um, Cloakroom, but I like them. If Audio Tree comments make you upset, I would fucking hate for you to read Hate Five Six comments. Oh my oh god, my lord! Uh, they the Hate Five Six comments on like Foxtails videos or oh my god, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just brutal. Um, but anyway, I thought this record was okay. I I think the production was very dry, and so the parts that were meant to sound heavy, I don't think sounded heavy enough for me. Um, but let me tell you something. This band can play a fucking guitar solo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, real, real fucking smooth, fluid guitar work on this record, uh, which I was a fan of. And I've been getting really into like Built to Spill again, and I kind of felt like the same like 
reverence for and subversion of like classic rock in the guitar solos on this record. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was gonna say there's like I I, I really dig like their 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 twang. You know, there's like some stuff in there that r- reminds me of like all of like Jason Molina's projects. And I'm not super into like shoegaze, so I think this is like a cool cool thing that they have going on. Yeah. yeah. Uh I think it's weird that you only like Cloakroom, Kyle. Like why? I I don't know. They just like uh the Cloakroom albums feel to me like what nothing's albums should have been after the EP collection. I mean like, like my favorite thing yeah. about Cloakroom is like the guitar tones and uh, Oh yeah. And like everything else, like I, like I know that every band doesn't have to be melodic, but like they're like anti melodic sometimes. I'm just like fuck this. I don't think they're anti melodic. I think I was gonna say though, they're like kind of dark. I I really like that because like they have some songs that are like pretty straightforward. But I think like on their last album, like they had like like the opener of that album was so like weird. Like all these weird chords is just really dark aura. I I figured out what I think Cloakroom sounds like, and someone tell me if I'm wrong, but I think they sound like emo Kylisa. I've never listened to Kylisa. <laughs> what? I'm a poser. What? I, uh, is that a shoegaze band? No, they're uh, th- they're desert rock band, mm. like stoner metal. <laughs> they're like associated with Queens of the Stone Age or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, I believe so. But much better than Queens of the Stone Age fucking ever were. There are a few yeah. other records that I'm confused people didn't vote for. Let's Did anyone here listen to the Taking Meds LP? Yeah. I love that record. I love do not that. Why that. I don't know why that missed the missed the board. I, I feel like people just like... I don't know if people just like didn't listen to that because it like just fell under everyone's radar. I mean, I don't... I, I don't... I, it, 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 like, I mean, that, it's, the band is so, so tight. Probably the tightest band I've, maybe I've ever seen. Definitely the tightest band I've ever toured with. The lyrics are so fucking dark. And if you ever get to get to know Skylar on a personal level, like, I mean, the record makes so much sense. But I mean, there there's a new EP coming out on a new label in the summer. So I don't know. I think the new Taking Meds speed might be uh, something everyone else can like catch on to. I'm really bummed because they were supposed to do uh, some dates with Gami uh, and then like a full US after that, but that might be getting, that definitely is, I don't know. I do not know what is happening with anything anymore. I really want them to do a run with Zeta. I think that would be sick. I don't know. They just have a crazy intensity. I was going to say, maybe the reason that it didn't get votes is because everyone heard the song I Hate You and thought it was about them. Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) Everyone is too... I don't know. I think that's like the only one that I can really, I really think of off the top of my head that I was like in love with that no one, no one put down. Uh, Kyle, I know you were in love with the Wicca Face album, Suffer On. Yeah, I do really like that. And I mean, I know that our emo, which isn't really our audience anymore, has an aversion to anything that has beats behind it these days. I still thought I mean, that at least one person would have voted for it. Is this like the album with like the little B feature on it? Or is that like the one before uh, I don't think that was on an album. I think that was just... Oh, one. really? Yeah. Um, I'm a poser. I, our emo kids better fucking get over it because, like, the future of rock is gonna be 808s instead of acoustic <laughs> drums. No. No, wait. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fucking drummer is Goodbye, locked Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like this album more than I did the first time I listened to it. Uh, everyone is telling me, like, because I love emo rap, it makes no sense that I'm not huge on Wicca Uh But that's not even necessarily true. I think I just like uh, prefer like him in more compressed settings. Um, I think he, he sounds better like EPs or singles than he does like in a full project. I agree. I was say like, uh, like Corinthiax, like that EP is so dope and like, I don't know, like sort of lose attention on the albums. It really sucks that his entire career has to be in the shadow of Absolute and Doubt, which is the best song that he's ever appeared on. Yo, but what about like Avoid? That was that was a sick song. I Avoid. think that's my favorite Wicca Phase one. You won't yeah, see I think us in the song. back. Goth boy click all black. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, 
I also really like the the song with Georgia Mac guesting on it. Um, I think oh, it's yeah. probably like it's okay a song. Yeah, uh, eventually, uh, Wikiphase is going to get written into emo history, whether uh, fucking Twinkle Dorks like it or not. So, yeah. <laughs> might as well get on the train while you can. And then that puts us in the the back half of our episode, or maybe not half, but <laughs> like the home stretch. I say, I hope not. We've been on <laughs> Skype for like two hours. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> EPs and emo adjace. Maybe in like if 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 I have like any regrets about the way that uh, Decade on the Influence shook out, I think maybe we should have put EPs in the in in the album like voting blocks. But so I did at first, and nobody voted for them. But okay. I think we became EP heavy like halfway through this whole series. Like as a, yeah. some of the heavy hitters were EPs, but. Yeah, I totally get it. Yeah, just because like right off, right off top, three of the like the three records that I think would have made a huge indent if they were on the list uh, are like the first three listed here. <laughs> All right, Commander Salamander off the goop. It's cool when any band starts an EP with like a beat. Like mm-hmm. it's us always like a good move. Uh, this record from the catastrophe the first time it was, you know, almost recorded like in like early 2018 to the band pretty much like breaking up to getting back together to the split coming out to off the goop coming out was uh, a pretty pretty gracious short fictions went on tour with commander salamander and uh those three lads are they're something that was <laughs> great folks <laughs> that was, <laughs> they're so funny we had so much fun that was great they're yeah. so woke yeah. Yeah, no, it's a. They're a, they're very. They're all they're all pretty mature. It's a. I see you have a hundred Gex here, and uh, they literally would not stop playing a hundred Gex. It was honestly <laughs> so annoying. <laughs> no, they got to Gex. I Boomer over that. here. <laughs> no, no, it was like sick. Like the first like like five times, and then by like time twenty of just hearing this album over and over again, I was like, please, can I listen to something else? I'm begging you. <laughs> I would. I would have responded by putting on McCafferty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, this this EP was fucking nuts, so and I was just like so proud of them, like for finally getting it out, because um, it felt like much more cohesive mission statement than Gross October, and more wide ranging in influence and tight in song structure and performance than the the Gami split. It just felt like the furthest Commander Salamander had ever like pushed themselves and. Um, I I am a huge comma salad stan, and this EP is their best work. I think. <laughs> I I agree. I really want to see this band put out an LP because I I just I, I want to see like what all they can come with together. But I don't I don't know. I mean I I was really with Liam going to Berkeley. I was really interested to see how that would affect like the dynamic of the writing process of that band because I don't. I mean, I don't know. I I just I want to see a commander LP, a commander a commander Salamander LP, like really, really badly. There's some cool stuff in store. I have on good authority. Yeah. Um, I want the LP to be called Back on the Goop. Turn to Goop. What is that? <laughs> Can you guys hear that? God damn it! Ryan, yes. is that you? My landlord has someone doing siding. Repairs <laughs> on my apartment. Oh. Okay. Okay. I thought it was just a. I thought it was a fucking ghost. <laughs> yeah. That'd be so sick. I thought I was about to die. Haunted podcast. What's Can you see the ghost of real emo? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, there's a there's a specter haunting the E-word podcast, <laughs> uh, and it is never better by nice. Another um, man that I'm really. That was a good segue. Through. Thank you. Uh, it really, really nice does like hang over the head of this podcast, uh, just because we have a pretend beef with Roddy, and um, people were mad about us talking about the CP on the freshman class episode, even though we said literally nothing but nice things about it. <laughs> we just were not nice enough, I guess. This band is sick as heck, and. Uh... I don't know if anyone has seen any of like their live videos of like their new stuff, but if you like Never Better, uh, the full length record is like literally just hits. I mean, it's everything that they did 
really well on Never Better. And uh, I don't know. I think they've all just matured as uh, just like songwriters and as people. Uh, the first record, like I wasn't like I didn't really got into like the first nice LP, and this was like a nice segue into uh, like them definitely finding like their sound. You know, are they going full power pop on the LP? Um, I don't know. Y'all are just gonna have to wait and find out. Fuck you with your AMC trailer ass. <laughs> <laughs> they're uh, they're they're definitely gonna come out with some bangers. Um. A lot of riffs, like which is which is dope, and I, I feel like if there's anything that Never Better was missing, it was like just like some more epic riff parts that like you hear in like Snowboard. So yeah, I word. I, okay. I'm very stoked for them. I love this album, and then they did the split with Gully Boys. That's also really good. And I've seen this band like I saw this band like 18 times last year, and they always played new stuff. And it, like you said, riffs and. Uh, some heavy hitting stuff, I think. Yeah, they're a great love band. Yeah. Uh, Jail Socks put out at least one EP last year. Whatever release has Steering Wheel on it is amazing. Yeah, that's the most that's the most recent EP. Um, I don't know. I feel like that came out like forever ago, but that that was just something that came out like last spring. This is like one of the this the next record that they put out like their next full length I think is gonna be like one of the records that ties in like finally is like that first record that pulls all the the pop punk kids and DIY kids yes like, yeah. together yes they I was have, gonna say they have that was, perfect chemistry punk uh, and it it feels kind of like a, it, it's fulfilling the promise of Sparkle Punk that I predicted so long ago uh, but they would never call themselves Sparkle Punk and oh, that's no, not of course not yeah and also. The first three bands here, Nice Commander Salamander and Gel Socks, all three pieces. And the next band is a three piece as well. Oh, that is true. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes a four piece, but yeah. But it's nuts that they're a three piece. Like yeah. it's been on record. Um but just still on the subject of Jail Socks, uh, I actually liked the new EP much better than like everything else that they've done before combined. And it's not like I dislike their older stuff. I just felt like they finally put together like just straight hits all the way through the the pop punk comparison is on point like it feels it feels very pop punk to me uh but not not in a bad way and it's yeah, still got the overbearing. they didn't go they didn't go full belmont <laughs> not yet <laughs> portrayal of guilt suffering is a gift uh this band played in my basement this band so was sick. sick so sick Dope band love them the promotion they had for this uh was super cool it's like the phone number you had to call and uh yes. yeah it was awesome that was a really really good idea i enjoy the fact that uh screamo is like finally owning the fact that it has black metal influence i feel like uh yeah. black metal and death metal has always had like screamo fans uh mm -hmm. and but now it's like kind of coming to the forefront and something that i think screamo has kind of missed in the last couple of years is just like fucking riffs and betrayal of guilt's got riffs like they're just like actually heavy and they feel like like a concrete sock in your gut like i oh, I, sure. I think the way that they like build and uh like the brief moments of like ambiance like work so well in contrast with like the blast beats um yeah. It, it's just like a monumental right and for how short it is it feels very epic <laughs> yeah i think it's their best release so far as the ep it's 10 minutes yeah. long right yeah yeah <laughs> so speaking of epic screamo <laughs> uh <laughs> death of spring split um which i think ha is like the most hype i've seen for a split in like at least two or three years um at least in my circle, because uh, all my Facebook friends are like weirdo screamo kids. Um, this record is cool in that uh, I think both both bands are like trying real hard to outdo each other, um, and it it ends up coming off like like not like one band doing a record, but like a split that feels like uh, very connected and full. You know? Oh yeah. No, we yeah. definitely like. Uh, it was very quick to put together. Like we we were both like equally willing to do this thing, and we were like, "All right, we're gonna make this whole thing about death. Like that's gonna be the the concept of the whole thing." So 
uh, and we like took influence from each other and we, like we kept each other posted about like what songs we were writing and like it was just super fun to do and yeah glad people like it i feel like for your health brought out some of shingard's chaos and i feel like shingard brought out uh for your health's fight riffs <laughs> oh yeah yeah i think my favorite thing about this death of spring uh probably more so like for your health side than shingard is like this is like the first not that i i mean i love all the songs on nosebleed um i know hayden really doesn't like them anymore but like the way that and oh you you like recorded it and mix and mastered this right yeah yeah i, I, put the whole thing I think together. like this is like the i mean the most cohesive like for your health release where you can hear like literally every aspect of that band that you need to that you don't necessarily get in like the first ep yeah i can see that um it, it feels like uh i think on nosebleeds there was kind of like a like kind of like a sort of dancey sassy influence um yeah. and then on uh their side of death of spring i think that it, they went like full disco screamo in some parts <laughs> oh yeah no like what, when they made nosebleeds like they weren't even like that serious about like committing to being an actual band like that stuff was thrown together it like i think they wrote all the songs in like a few days and they just like recorded it so like i think that the spring is like the first release they made that's like they're really trying to like be committed to being a band and yeah. it's dope i'm really proud of the split and like it, you kind of worry like how much attention is like the split gonna get but i think because like we had a concept that we adhered to uh, it ended up being uh, an enjoyable listen so yeah, yeah I, don't, I can't remember like a split like a self-release split being so like i don't know i feel like everyone was like really hyped on the split and like I feel like you just don't see that a lot with like DIY bands having splits is like literally everyone being so hype on the whole thing. It didn't Fantano like didn't he shoot out a, a Yeah, he shared like, it. Got out the band yeah. yeah, that's dope as fuck. I uh I got yelled at cuz I accidentally uh <laughs> uh leaked oh the split. Oh my god. <laughs> That was, oh, so, is, that was so dumb. That whole situation was dumb. Uh, <laughs> I still think so that funny. video was I, funny. Yeah, no, we. I was just with Hayden not too long ago, and they were like, do you remember when you you leaked Death of the Spring? And I was like, oh, shut up. Hayden, Hayden's the one that leaked it. <laughs> Hayden know. literally shared like the Google Docs folder of I, it. It was like, here's the split. And it's like, wow. <laughs> All right. That was very funny. Love them yeah. lots. That was hilarious. <sighs> Microwave. I've never listened to this album because I don't like this band. I don't yeah, know if that's a good album. Song. The only Microwave song that I really like is the, the, the lighter list or lighters. Or I don't really know anything about this band like at all. They're not an emo band. What they're, are they? are like... Soft punk? I don't, feel, I don't even know how I feel about this band. Apparently it's a horny album. That's what I saw people on Twitter oh, that's saying. Sick. Ooh, very sex posy. They uh, they had a, they did have a split in like 2015 with this band called Head North that I really used to like, like way back in the day. But that is all I know about Microwave. They were supposed to, they had they uh had a headlining tour with Dog Legs supposed to be on it. That's also what I know about Microwave. Um, I'll move on to Remo Drive. Uh, Ooh. people that like Remo Drive like to pretend that this album doesn't exist but i don't think it's that bad i think it's i don't know people really shit on them for not writing greatest hits part two and i kind of feel bad for them for that it kind of blows my mind that remo drive have their own subreddit they have their own subreddit yes um and the most activity it's ever seen is when uh like accusations came out against them <laughs> oh bummer uh well yeah i don't know i've never i don't think i've ever listened to this record either I don't even Anybody think I remember the... when they were like super emo before Greatest Hits. Yep. Yeah, and then they took all that stuff uh, out. That stuff was sick. Yeah, they kind of sounded like Title Fight back then. Yeah. Yeah. That stuff was dope. Eric Paulson's side project was also pretty cool, although I forget what it was called. Oh, uh, Focus Ring or something like that. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they had some pretty catchy songs there. I have not listened to this record. I probably not, though. We'll see. Um, I threw Strange Ranger on here because 
I got yelled at for not putting the last Strange Ranger album on the list. This one's and then like it doesn't even sound emo to me. This record. This one sounds like Third Eye Blind. Yeah, um, which is honestly like a, a great selling point for me personally because Third Eye Blind was uh, in top three power pop bands in the nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it. I think Strange Ranger. Uh, I think it's really unfortunate that they kind of suffered from like a loss of popularity when they changed their name. What was their name? Um, Sioux Falls. Sioux Falls. Yeah. Oh um, no, that was the same band. The Sioux Falls album yeah, but... is still only on Spotify on, on under Sioux Falls, so like people don't even find them. Damn. Yeah. But I, I've always, I, I, I think Strange Ranger. Uh, over the course of this series, I've kind of like grown to really appreciate their songwriting. Um, I think they're really good at like stretching ideas to like a reasonable song length. The record that they put out like uh, like a couple years ago, um, I remember thinking these songs are too long, and then like really going to love how long the songs are. Um, but this record is a lot more tight and cohesive and just like, like powerful. Agreed. Uh, Pup morbid stuff. I'd say this is the first time Pup got a little mid on me. Yeah, I don't. This this record just sounds like a Roswell kid b-side record to me <laughs> yeah i don't know nothing nothing too special that really stuck out uh they took beach bunny on tour which was really yeah. fucking cool yeah um, uh, i think like pup is like the biggest rock bands that aren't just like cock rock or something i don't know how to put it but like they are gi- fucking gigantic like they'll sell out any tour that they'll go on yeah, yeah. That, they they wild. transitioned to full normie core with this album. I think I said that before, but I, they like. I don't think I ag- agree with that though. Like, there's still some like pup in this album. I don't mean that it doesn't sound like pup. I I mean just that like their fan base has just been growing oh, exponentially. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah their fans yeah. are normies now for sure. Just on the subject of this album, um, the song sounds so much better live when they play it with energy. I think the the production of this album just like drags so much of that like quintessential pup like violently throwing yourself around in a basement energy mm-hmm. where's this band from canada nice so i guess they're not gonna be touring around here for a little bit i don't i don't think i've ever seen pup live i know for a fact i've never seen pup live i only I saw know. them when they were like first of four on a show when was that uh 2015 it was like oh. it was like pup cloud nothings and proto martyr that's so weird. It and was then now the, the one out of them to blow up. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the next record on this, I feel like, was just, like, everything that I didn't like with the Pup record, I loved with the Heart Attack Man record. Mm. Oh, my God, yeah. I fucking love this album. It was my number one of last year. Yeah, I know. I, was, I wasn't... I was kind of surprised that it was your uh, album of the year, but then, like, the more I listened to it... I think I'd only listened to it once before you said that you knew it was going to be your record of the year, and then I listened to it, and I was like... Yo, I really get this. And I really thought I liked the Manson Family record that came out like prior to this, but I don't know. The the songwriting this is so tongue in cheek, just like really fun. Yeah, in retrospect, I think I kind of like like the Manson Family a lot less just yeah, because no, this record like Yeah, this record took a lot of like uh what they were doing on the Manson Family and just pumped it up to 11. Um the lyrics are like so much darker. The hooks are so much like stronger and in your face. I I feel like one of the things that drew me to the band and simultaneously has become like almost like weirdly a, an obstacle for people getting into them is their Twitter presence. Like I see people now <laughs> just talking shit about their Twitter all the time, but I still love their Twitter. <laughs> I don't think it's jumped the shark. Yeah, I mean I don't think it's I don't think Eric's ever said anything that's like super offensive or anything. I think it's just like silly and people are like. I don't know what anyone's issue with it is. I think it's, I think it's hilarious. He weeded yeah. out the libs with the the whole knife thing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> which I thought I thought that, that was so fucking tight. Yeah. <laughs> I, for I, real. I, I want more bands to have weapon merch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm I just trying to like, get there. I just I want people to like not be afraid to have like the same, you know, Twitter presence. I want bands to be like not afraid to have their management like text them and be like, yo, you should probably delete that tweet. <laughs> you know, I feel like I feel like that's just like almost I love that like just as much as I, I really enjoy the record. 
Yeah, uh, there is one Heart Attack Man tweet that I wish they would delete, and it's the recent one where Eric cuts up a banana and eats it with the skin on. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was bad. <laughs> or what about, like, the... There was, like, one where uh, Eric put, like, ketchup on his toothpaste, and... Oh, that was just... <laughs> Horrifying. Yeah. I wish that band didn't just tour with like not like or not loose, like Knuckle Puck and like just like I fucking I, wish they tour with Knocked Loose. That would be an insane that's show. What I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Graphic. Like, I mean I really know that I like Eric loves hardcore and like is also in a sick ass band. A sick ass Oh Highway band. Sniper. Yes. Yo. I was going to say, Eric came to the Death of Spring vinyl release show in Akron. That was fun. Yeah, that kid loves hardcore, and if anyone here fucks with hardcore, listen to Highway Sniper, because it's him and uh, Skyler from Taking Meds. Yeah, have you heard uh, any of his old hardcore bands from so, before? Yeah, so, Ages in particular is so fucking good. It, it should be a much more well-known piece of history that at their first show they did a power violence cover of Heart Attack Man by the Beastie Boys. <laughs> That's wild. I mean, is this record not an emo record? I considered Heart Attack Man like more of a power pop band uh, before this, but I think maybe with Fake Blood they kind of like shredded into more emo territory. Uh, but their their fans kind of seem to be a, a healthy mix of DIY kids and pop punk kids and hardcore kids. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I wish I wish this band toured with just like straight up hardcore bands. I think that'd be fucking sick. Like, oh yeah. Like Heart Attack Man and like Kubai Clan or something. I don't know. <laughs> Kublai Clan. Kublai Clan. That band Kublai Clan ain't nothing to fuck funny. with. <laughs> I like that band. Floral tattoos on here, which I'm really fucking happy about. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we just kind of forgot to put them on this list. Um, I didn't know this but... album came out this, in 2019. I'm pretty sure it did. Uh, um, but it didn't like blow they're... up until this year, right? It took him a minute for them to get some traction, but I think we have cred for having Gwen from Floral Tattoo on on the pod like long before they had any notoriety. Gwen and I actually go like way back as friends, and they're a huge fixture of the Pacific Northwest DIY scene. And I I really I really like this album. Again, I I kind of do see like lots of Glass Beach comparisons. No, I I, yeah. I feel like that totally makes sense. I they're a band that like. Anytime I have the opportunity to send a band through the Pacific Northwest, like they're always like the perfect fit with pretty much no matter who I want to send through. Like they just yeah. they me they they mesh so well with almost anyone, and I want them to do like a full U.S. really bad. That would be super sick to see them out on the East Coast or like supporting someone. Yeah, their vibes are a little bit of everything. They got a little bit of Jeff Rosenstock, got a little bit of emo, got a little bit of prog rock. Even like they're just cool. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think they could definitely be anyone's new favorite band easily speaking of bands that got a little bit of everything uh was there any record from last year that was more batshit insane than die on mars by callous that voice <laughs> no not no, so nothing, sick. nothing even like come like close like i, I say. <laughs> this is the best and like i don't know if anyone is even like familiar with like dow boy stuff like prior to this release i mean that took like just like okay, like an okay metalcore band from Georgia, and like adding Jackie and adding uh, Adam the drummer, like blew that band up. Like that band yeah. is doing insane shit. They're just totally chaotic, absurd stuff. Yeah. I am so stoked for like what they're doing next. I'm, they I'm were not. Five. They were not nearly as chaotic like before this record. They had. They had songs where it was just one riff the whole way through, which is unthinkable. Like <laughs> when you listen to "Die on Mars," they, which sounds to my ears like "Every Time I Die" meets "Botch" meets "My Chemical Romance" meets like "Cursive." Like it's just like a nutso record. Yeah, I don't um, know. With short fictions being like label mates with Cow's Out Boys, I I think I don't know. I want to tour with them so bad. It's gonna be wild. Yeah. That band should deservedly take over the world. Are they yeah. like getting big in that uh, mathcore world? Because oh, like, they're huge yeah. in the mathcore okay. world. Okay, because like that's like a very very vibrant scene. I feel like it I has been say, for, like, for, for forever. But yeah, the next they thing are they gonna do be is going to be huge. Frontier level. Oh, for sure, absolutely. Yeah. Like, if not, like potentially bigger. Like, I know they were. Oh, 
they were gonna do some stuff with Kaunashi and oh that would be so sick that would be so dope like oh they're just so tight the next thing they do is gonna be so huge I'm I'm unbelievably stoked for them I'm also mm-hmm. making electronic music with Carson right now it's, yeah. it's really silly stuff <laughs> it's gonna be funny and electronic stuff brings us to the final record on this list 100 gex 1000 gex don't everyone speak at once <laughs> <laughs> i am personally cool. just glad that i saw them like a week before quarantine happened did i see the final 100 gex show of this year probably shit Fuck. Uh, yeah, I think their show out here got canceled. I, I I'm so stoked that they like toured with Camp. That was like wild big for them. Um, is it fair to say that like the biggest reason that 100 Gex blew up in DIY circles is because Laura wore that I hate sex shirt? I literally in, just in, talk about that money machine. Yeah, Rest I hate peace. sex. I hate sex literally like repress that shirt because of that music video <laughs> yeah, yeah I, you're I, like I, twice sure. i know i bought that shirt because of that i was like yo that's sick <laughs> ringtown by 100 gex might be like the catchiest song i've ever heard in my entire life you know that Same. remix with charlie xcx like mm-hmm. so yeah, nasty mind blowing it's like i listened to that a lot for like a week and then i stopped but it's like still really cool and what i I can't even imagine what the hype's gonna be like for their next thing i think uh they're gonna go like much further than you would have ever expected like a, a, like their 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 early material is still good but like really derivative of like pc music and like other kind of alternative pop of of our era um, but they they just keep pushing themselves into more like chaotic and yet catchy compositions, and I think they are eventually going to be like alt pop kings. I believe it. Can, yeah, cannot be happier that I I had the chance to get on that even even as early as like a couple months ago um, because I, I I think they're going to be huge. <laughs> And that is it for 2019. That's it for a decade under the influence. Damn, that was like six months worth of. Is that how long? How long was the decade? When was the first decade? 2019 is 12 months long. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The first episode came out in early March last year, so we did this for for 12 months. Holy hell! What's uh? What's next for the E word? Uh, trying to get guests that people wished were on. Yeah. So not us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hurts. Gosh darn it. Yeah, real, really a shame that y'all were never on the E-word. <laughs> it only took to episode 50. The hell? No. My uh, my hope for episode 50 is that it's going to be the Jeremy Bolm episode. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> that would be cool. but, yeah, we want to do... Who's the biggest what? person you've hit up and be like, come on the pod? Probably we hit up. Holden. Oh, and I guess that oh. we hit up is different. I I don't know because yeah. like I think I think Christian Holden probably was our like most celebrity guest. Uh, uh, we got uh, completely ghosted by Anthony Fantano. Huh. Doesn't ever doesn't everybody? I don't think anyone's ever had a real conversation with that man. <laughs> no, he, he was on washed up email. Was he really? Yeah, yeah. and then. Dang. And then he was on Blink-155 and said the exact same thing that he did on Washed Up Emo. Oh, so yeah, you're right. Not a real conversation. I think he just Only goes up before he talks. I think he just doesn't want to be emo-splained. Yeah. <laughs> Don't emo-splain me, kid. <laughs> yeah, while y'all been talking, I'm just chowing down on some eggplant parmesan right now. <laughs> I've, been, I've literally been chowing down for like the past hour. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh, yeah. good parm. Yeah, this shit's great. <laughs> Yo, anyone listen to that tsunami demo? That's the that's 2019 best of the year. You're a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did anybody listen to Silent Alarm Live? Well, that record just crap. Are you talking about Block Party? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the greatest band ever. You know? Okay. 
that's yeah, not. I feel I feel like that's a very typical drummer statement. Block <laughs> <laughs> party is so sick. Like eating glass has the best drum intro of all time. Uh, excuse me, this is semi charmed life by third eye blind erasure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll go back to eating my Parmesan. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much for coming on. Like, hell yeah! Thank you so much. Uh, you were really, really looking forward to this episode. I was gonna say, like, I didn't even know Alex and Ryan were gonna be on until like, what, like yesterday, today? I didn't yeah. know Ryan was gonna be on until we had a short fiction band meeting at two, and Ryan was like, "Can I come?" And I was like, <laughs> "Yes." <laughs> yeah, I I really didn't. Have much input, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel like I just spectated. And the only stupid. album Ryan has listened to on this list was Portrayal of Guilt, <laughs> Dom, yeah, a lot of Fictions, and Shingard. I listened to, yeah, I basically didn't uh, listen to Ryan only listens to jazz music. No, yo, I, was, I mean, literally, like this week, I listened to like eight albums I would never have listened to. Unless I was on this podcast, so most people me back just kind of phase. give it up and don't listen to them. Yeah, <laughs> which um, sometimes leads to really cool conversations, and other times leads to not so fun conversations. I really, uh, really hope that Corey listened and liked Fiddlehead after we talked about them for twenty minutes to him. Big same, yeah. Uh, the only album I listened to on this list was uh, "Breathe" by Tiny Moving Parts. In fact. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that Sam Schreiber uh, bought a tiny moving parts record for? Yeah, messed up. Cancelable. No, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He actually didn't do that. <laughs> uh, I did check out Forest right before this though, and they were super fire. So I need to go through and like listen to this entire uh, this entire list you got because it seems like some good stuff, you know. <laughs> really? There were so many. There were so many records that like I thought were gonna be on this list and i was like damn worst party ever is not on here and i was like oh shit that literally came out in february it just feels like the last month was like two months combined right yeah yeah i wish there, Honestly, there was like a big law to like just pause time and 2020 can like resume when this whole thing dies down yeah yeah that'd be so <laughs> sick it feels like the oh in like 2020 it feels like that came out like three years ago i was like wait that record came out this past year. I like totally just, it feels like so forever ago. It really does. And it's 2020 now. So it's like, <laughs> really makes you think. It's like, yo, pretty bonkers. Yeah, it's like 2020 and Death of Spring. What do you think we were predicting? 